Some of you may be lucky enough to know a research scientist like me. Some of you may be unlucky enough to be a research scientist <laughs> like me. But all of you probably have some notion of what we're like and what our job entails. So when I asked my friends, non-scientist friends, what words they would use to describe us, I heard that we're knowledgeable, inquisitive, analytical, a little boring, don't quite agree with that one, uh, that our jobs are repetitive and tedious. One friend even said that to him, scientists were old dudes with crazy hair carrying beakers full of coloured liquid. Well, contrary to those descriptions and how we're portrayed on screen, I have only known one Doc Brown lookalike, and we almost never have flasks filled with bubbling green goo clutched in our hands. We're not all socially awkward or weird either. So it was pretty clear from talking to those people closest to me that there wasn't a great understanding of just what it is that I do. There also wasn't an understanding of the positive impact that science can have on the future economy of Australia. I mean, I bet you didn't know that every dollar invested in health and medical research will yield a $3 return in health economic benefit. With returns like that, you'd think the government would be jumping at the chance to invest in research. Unfortunately, they're not, but I'll get to that in a little bit. In the meantime, here's some other fun facts. We now have drugs that are so effective that a certain type of leukaemia is seen as more of a chronic illness rather than the death sentence that it once was. That's due to health and medical research. P uh, children with the type of leukaemia that I work on, the survival rate has increased from 4% in the 1950s to around 85% today. That's also due to health and medical research. Sometimes I think if scientists were just a little better at marketing themselves to the general public, people would better understand the integral role that we play in everyone's health. There's probably not a person in the room who hasn't been affected in some way by cancer or heart disease or mental health issues. Well, the therapies and the diagnostic procedures and the imaging techniques that doctors use to identify and treat these conditions, all of those come from years and years of scientific study. I mean, that's the thing about health and medical research. It affects us all. So we should all be concerned about the future of the industry. But probably to care as much as I do, people need to first understand what goes on behind the lab coats, behind the beakers and pipettes. So I'm going to give you a sneak peek into what goes on in my life as a research scientist. So when I was younger, I didn't always envisage doing this. At one point, I actually wanted to be something far more respectable. I wanted to be a lawyer. But my aptitude for learning and an attention to detail that some would tell you borders on compulsive, these traits aligned perfectly with some of the key characteristics necessary for a successful scientist. In addition to being curious with a twist of OCD, we're also required to have a hefty splash of dogged grit and determination. We need a stubborn persistence to keep trying after the umpteenth experiment has failed. We need unwavering dedication to carry on after receiving yet another failed funding application. And these days we're also required to be great communicators. We have to get people as excited about our studies as we are. Excited enough to read our manuscripts, excited enough to fund our proposals, excited enough so that you're not checking your phones when we're up on stage giving a talk. These weren't things that I was told about in university. I also wasn't told how hard it would be to continually muster the passion required to do our jobs. Because as one colleague told me, research is more of a lifestyle than a career. Some of you may be thinking that none of what I said seems that onerous. Just how hard could it be to get people interested in a cutting edge cancer study? What exactly is so hard about undertaking medical health, health and medical research? For me, it's not the many years of study that I've done. It's not the countless hours I've spent in the lab. It's not the figurative blood and quite literal sweat and tears I've shed designing and carrying out experiments. It's not the writing, rewriting, submitting, revising, resubmitting, and finally, often 12 months later, getting my manuscript published. I don't find any of these things as difficult as the lack of adequate funding and non-existent job security. You see, for the majority of researchers, especially those at my career stage, our salaries are completely dependent on grant funding. This means that if the grant under which we are employed expires, so does the position. Um, take my career, 
after 10 years in the industry, amassing some pretty decent research outputs, I've only just managed to secure a guaranteed three years of salary funding. Up until this year, my professional life consisted of 12 month contracts. It's crazy, my salary was more assured when I was an unqualified PhD student. And I'm not an isolated case at all. A recent survey into, of health and medical scientists found that at the end of 2016, one in four researchers didn't know if they would have a job in six months' time. One in four. That's 25% of people who are working at improving the health outcomes for Australians who didn't know if they'd have a job the following year. And this is simply because there is not enough money to fund an expanding research sector. So I've already said how our studies are dependent on grants and these come, the grants are from external funding bodies, the largest of which is the Australian Government's National Health and Medical Research Council. And while the amount of world-class research coming out of Australia has increased recently, the government funding to support this research has remained stagnant for the last five years. And this has resulted in there not being enough money to go around. You just have to look at the success rates of submissions to the National Health and Medical Research Council. Last year, they were a measly 19.5%, and total government spending on new health and medical research didn't even reach $1 billion. That may seem like a lot, but putting it in context, the new Defence Submarine Fleet is expected to cost 150 times that amount. So you'll be forgiven for thinking that all of my complaining I think being a researcher is the worst job in the world. I need to assure you that it's not. It's actually a pretty good gig. I'm fortunate enough to work in a profession where overseas travel is not only supported, but actively encouraged. I've had the privilege of presenting my research to people from all over the world. And for my Fulbright exchange, I got to work for a year learning cutting edge laboratory techniques from the world leader in my field. And I'm sure if you asked a researcher who's worth their weight in for pets, they would tell you that the pros of our job outweigh the job uncertainty, long hours, and sacrificed weekends and holidays. That said, things do need to change. We've heard tonight that Senator Fulbright is, was an aspirational man with a vision. So what are my aspirations for the future of health and medical research in this country? If I was given three wishes, what would they be? Firstly, I wish for a greater understanding of the challenges that researchers are facing right now. I don't think politicians fully grasp the immense pressure that the research sector is under, but they're the ones that make the decisions that affect our futures. Some of you may have heard of the Medical Research Future Fund, and yeah, this is gonna be a game changer. For those who don't know, uh, it's a, a fund that's been established to disperse, predicted to disperse $1 billion by the year 2021 every year. And yes, this will alleviate some of the issues that I've outlined tonight, but it's not a panacea. We need additional funding to support the people behind the breakthroughs. We need additional funding to support the basic discovery research that comes before the clinical translation and commercialization for which the fund is going to support. And we need additional money now, not in 2021. So my second wish is for the government to commit to funding all stages of the research pipeline. And this would come from an immediate and sustained increase in the National Health and Medical Research Council's budget. Australia can afford to do this. We just need a government who is brave enough to make it happen. My third wish I fear is probably not quite as attainable. And I wish that researchers were able to enjoy a better quality of professional life. One that's more on par with other vocations. I wish that we didn't have to spend our weekends and our holidays thinking about work, or worse, doing work sometimes. I wish that on the odd occasion we did leave work in the lab on a Friday evening, that we didn't feel guilty about it. And I really wish that we didn't have to jump on a never-ending grant application cycle, that we could stop and revel in our successes before writing the next one. But what needs to happen for my wishes to be granted? Firstly, we need job security. And we need the government to recognise that research funding in Australia is stagnant and we desperately need additional funds to ensure the future of health and medical research in this country. So, yes, I 
have painted a pretty bleak picture of what it's like to be a researcher in the current funding climate, but at the end of the day is what I love to do. And like any great love, there will be sacrifices, there will be pain, but there will also be supreme fulfillment and joy. I think I'm one of the lucky people who get to say that they truly enjoy their job. I get to design experiments that are going to legitimately improve the health outcomes of people with leukaemia. And that gives me a really special feeling. One that gives me great pride to say, I am a scientist. Thank you. <laughs>